Hey, hey, what's up, garden friends? Yes, your tropical plant party. How's everybody doing? I hope you're good. I am great. Throughout the last few videos on the channel, I've had people asking me about the plants that I have floating around down here in the pond, specifically like, what's the deal here? Really fairly common, but beautiful plant, the Stromanthi thelia trio star, trio star, trio star, really whichever you prefer. This was formerly the Stromanthi Sanguinea trio star, now it's Thelia trio star. That's the name, probably a plant you recognize. If not, then feast your eyes on this absolutely beautiful, stunning plant. But yeah, anyway, so people have been asking me what's going on here. The way I've been growing these plants is maybe a little bit different, not maybe, fairly different from how they're traditionally grown. I grow this plant a few different ways. We'll go ahead and talk about that, talk about how I'm growing the plants, the different ways I've been growing these plants over the years, and go over the care. Just a fun little plant spotlight, plant chat, whatever you want to call it. Start off with the quick care for people who aren't here for a long video. The Stromanthi trio stars really do prefer a high light situation, medium to high light, but not direct. Don't want the light to be shining directly onto them. That can scorch the foliage. Like an organically rich, well-drained potting media. So soil that's going to drain well, but hold on to a decent amount of moisture. These don't like to dry out. Sizes can vary considerably depending on where you live and how you're growing the plant. Generally anywhere from two to three feet high by two to three feet wide is fairly common. Common. If you're growing them in a really warm, humid atrium, some or maybe just outdoors, you'll someplace where you grow as a perennial, then they can get up to five feet sometimes. I have always generally fertilized these with an all-purpose fertilizer that I dilute to a half to a quarter of the strength, depending on how often I fertilize. I only fertilize during the active growing season or just when the plant's growing actively. During the winter, I tend to cut way back on the fertilizer unless it shows signs of growth. If it's still growing then I'll go ahead and fertilize about every other week with that nice diluted fertilizer. I do usually recommend diluting the fertilizer though because they do have a tendency to scorch. Trio stars propagate very easily just by division. You just cut the rhizomes apart and repot your little offshoots into new containers. You'll have a whole bunch of them to share. They grow fairly quickly under favorable conditions and they're non-toxic. So safe to have around your dogs, cats, children, curious mouths, should be okay with them. Talk about an awesome house plant. The Trio Stars have been popular for decades. These are plants that I've been seeing around the nurseries. I'm gonna keep kicking my tripod, sorry about that. Plants that I have been seeing around since, like, since I was a little kid. Really common in the nursery trade. That's because of this beautiful foliage on the plants. And for being a Calathea, essentially, they're pretty easy to grow. Not to say that there aren't people who have issues with them, there are some uh, nuances to growing these plants sometimes. And usually the issues that happen with these are related to the temperature, the light, and humidity. That's not very helpful. I'm gonna talk a little bit more specifically about those issues, I suppose. In the wild, out in nature, this is a plant that grows in areas with really, really organically rich soil, very hummusy, full of all kinds of dead, decaying matters that holds on to a fair amount of water, but drains freely. Does that make sense? It's moisture retentive is what I should say. Areas with high rainfall throughout Brazil and parts of South America. It is also very warm and very humid. Not conditions we really have in the house, but they still seem to do well for a lot of people in the home. I think that where things get tricky is when temperatures are more on the cool side and then the plants are sopping wet and then there can be issues with root rot. And the plants do like to be consistently moist, but not to the point that the soil's like just saturated with water. I know that that might seem kind of weird considering these are floating in water. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Humidity struggles are usually such a huge problem with these plants. Not as much the Stromanthi trio stars as like a lot of the Calatheas. There are things you can do to combat that, like misting the leaves, getting those leaves nice and moist. You have to do that very often though. The problem with this method, there are a few issues actually with spraying the foliage. One of them is that this only provides humidity for the plant as that water's evaporating. As soon as it's gone, then it's, it's over. It's not keeping the plant moist anymore, keeping the air moist around the plant. 
And then if the water is too hard or too cold, the temperature's wrong, it's too hot, there can be lots of issues with the water is what I'm trying to say that sometimes can bug the plant. So it's something to do cautiously. It's not going to be a method that works for everybody where you live. It's just going to depend on your water as far as leaving spots and those sorts of issues on the leaves. Grouping them together with lots of other plants is usually a great way to increase humidity because plants release vapor as they transpire as the transpiration process happens. They expel water through the stoma and the leaves, the pores, water, vapor comes out with the gases and that helps raise the humidity. I have a video I did a couple years ago that I'm just going to reference down below. It was um, growing moisture loving plants, specifically it was about maidenhair ferns. But I think that that video, if you're struggling with humidity, that that video would be really helpful with this plant and with Calathea in general, because really the maidenhair fern, a lot of the struggles people have with them are very similar to the struggles that people have with their Calatheas. And a lot of the solutions are going to be the same as well. But if you don't feel like watching that video, totally understand. I'll link it at the end of this video in the description. You can also just do a tray with some gravel and some water in it. Just make sure the bottom of the pot's not in contact with the water. Having a humidifier, that helps an awful lot too. Give that a shot. Keeping them away from a really extreme drafts or just air blasting around the plant, that's going to dry them out more quickly also. And then of course the misting, that works as well. And uh, if maybe you live someplace really, really arid, top dressing the soil with something might be helpful because it'll slow down how quickly the water's evaporating from that soil blend. So when I haven't been growing these in the pond, there are two other ways. The main ways that I prefer to grow them, aside from right here, is to have them just potted up like a normal house plant. I'll usually take a all-purpose potting mix, mix it with a good amount of organic compost, some sand, some uh, chunky bark, some charcoal, to really kind of lift it up so that air can get in there while still making sure that that soil is going to hold on to moisture. And then it, I place them outside. I'm talking summertime when nighttime temperatures are above 50, 50 Fahrenheit, 55, somewhere in there below that. They can go cooler than that, but they're not going to grow actively. They need warmer temperatures to be growing. So I'll usually set them in a tree somewhere, usually facing north so that they'll just get dappled morning light and then shade throughout the rest of the day. And then as the season progresses a few weeks later, I'll move them into a little bit more sunlight and uh, make sure that they don't get any more than probably an hour of direct sun during the morning. That's about all they can take. They're very heavily variegated. So scorch pretty easily if the sun's beaming right down on that white foliage. And then as with all my plants, I'll fertilize them about every other week, sometimes once a week, depending on how ambitious I'm feeling that season. The more frequently I fertilize, then the more diluted that fertilizer is going to be. So if I were to fertilize with every watering, then it would just be like, I don't know, maybe a fourth to maybe even an eighth, the recommended dosage on the packaging of the fertilizer to uh, going up to maybe half strength. If I'm only fertilizing every two weeks, then that would probably be okay. Their roots can burn sometimes. So it's usually a better idea just to be safe if using like a boxed, synthetic fertilizer to make sure that it's been diluted fairly well. I have noticed that this is a plant that does really seem to enjoy the seaweed fertilizers. Even the fish fertilizers, I've kind of moved away from those because I just, I can't with the smell, especially this time of year when all of the plants are inside. I, it's so gross. The entire gross space in here just ends up smelling like the penguin house. It's a zoo. But the whole point is they seem to enjoy those seaweed fertilizers fairly well. Under optimal conditions, these will bloom and they have the prettiest, I think the prettiest blooms on them. The flowers don't get much attention though. I don't see a lot of people who get excited about them, but it, it, maybe because it's not a very big flower, they don't always come up very high above the foliage. So sometimes maybe they just look kind of boring. I don't know. I, they're like hot pink and beautiful. They stick up just a little bit above the foliage. I'll have a picture up here on the screen. Maybe you're seeing them right now. I don't know. They don't bloom as often when kept indoors all year. Usually they need to get outside and have some warmth and some shifts between day and night to help trigger the flowering in them. The flowering usually happens for me anytime between March and July, somewhere in there. I think their actual bloom season is March and April. But you know, when you're growing things indoors part of the year and outdoors part of the year, sometimes that can <laughs> mess with the blooming cycles on things. So that's how I had always grown these plants. And I say had, past tense, and that's because things have changed somewhat over the last few years. 
it used to be I would see these at the local nurseries every spring and early summer just sold as assorted tropicals normally for like $12.99 to $29.99 somewhere in there and it like 10 inch pots so nice big hefty sized plants and they were relatively cheap when I would get them in those larger sizes and I would go ahead and usually if it was a 10 inch pop pop <laughs> 10 inch pot then I would bump it up to a 12 inch pot and have it as a floor plant nowadays at least over the last couple of years I don't see them in those larger sizes anymore. I typically only see them in four to six inch containers, which is what both of these were. This one was sent to me from um, Pammy's Planty Things here on YouTube, and it's been doing well. It's just a little guy. Got a little bit of cold damage, so it's bouncing back from that, but it's growing pretty quickly, actually. And this one I potted up into this floating pond container last winter. I think I may have done it in a vlog. I can't remember, but it's been growing wonderfully since then it was just in a little four inch pot grown a fair amount the whole point there though was that when they're not in bigger containers i didn't like to have them sitting outside on the ground under the trees because they'd get knocked over blown over little four inch pots and cans they're just gonna get knocked over by the squirrels or the dogs that's why i haven't been growing them in the traditional way that i used to just because i found this to be much easier like i said we'll talk about that the other way that's really easy to grow these gotta reach under my desk here pull a plant out because these are plants that like so much moisture and humidity and that can be a problem sometimes for some people sort of depends on where you live in your climate but i have found that these plants do very well in self-watering containers. It takes a lot of the difficulty out of growing them. There's some stuff that needs to be trimmed out of here. That's just old growth. Not a big deal, it's just part of having plants and having them grow. Gotta go in sometimes and trim out the old leaves. That's good, that means the plant's growing. So self-watering container. This stromanthi has been doing wonderfully in here. You can see it has a little viewing window. It's fairly full. This was totally full yesterday, so that's how much water this plant's taken up just overnight. I was going to move the tripod up higher, but I thought it might be nice to get a shot of the undersides of these leaves here since you can't see that on the other ones. But this one has been doing so well in this container. I'll show you, I'll pull it out here. It needs to be bumped up a size. I'm gonna order a new container sometime in the next few days because right now it's in a six inch. I think it needs to go to an eight to a 10 inch. You ready? Look at that. Oh, lots and lots of roots coming out of the bottom of that pot. So I want to get this moved up into something more suitable because I can squeeze it, I can feel it. You can even see the bumps and the bulges on the sides. When the pot's really firm like that, it's time to repot the plant. And well, this obviously also time to repot the plant. Just now realizing that for some reason, the wicking cord's not in the bottom of this pot. It's bizarre and no good because that's what provides the function of the self-watering container. The roots have come out far enough that I suppose it doesn't necessarily matter. It seems to be doing okay. I have some of the self-watering just picks that come from the plants that come from the big box store. Any of those holes were open, I would just go ahead and stab that right on in there. That would solve that problem. Like I said, I don't think I need to worry about it. I'm not sure where the cord went, but it should be okay. It was something though that I did want to talk about anyways with these plants. Self wicking cord, just cotton cord. You can get this stuff off Amazon really cheap or I think there's even types of yarn you can just use. This stuff right here is an absolute game changer when it comes to growing the stromanthes, a lot of calatheas and a lot of ferns, like maiden hair ferns. If you have some of this, where are my scissors? Where'd my scissors go? Okay, I lost my scissors. Just pretend that I cut this right here. What I usually do is I take a chopstick and I pull it nice and tight onto this, onto the very end, really tight like this. Then I poke that up through one of the drainage holes. I'll usually do it in two of the drainage holes in the bottom of the container and then set that into a bowl or inside of another pot that has the water in the bottom with some rocks or something to make sure that the bottom of the pot's not in contact with the water. Just a DIY self-watering container, just making what this was already in. Doing that makes such a tremendous difference with growing these plants. Something I would highly recommend, not just for this, for any calatheas or like maiden hair ferns. Like I said, game changer. It makes a huge difference in how the plants perform. Or just buy a pre-made self-watering container. That's usually the easier way to go. The only thing I will say about self-watering containers is just, at least this is my own personal thing, I do usually prefer to have a safety hole drilled into the pots. I haven't done that with this one. I've just been keeping an eye on it. But by safety hole, what I mean is at the top of the line or wherever the very bottom of the pot is that the plant's in, 
I like to make sure that there's a hole drilled in the pot so that I don't have to worry about accidentally overfilling things because you don't want the water to be up so high that it's actually in contact with the bottom of the pot and you start to have anaerobic action going on there, bad bacteria grows, get root rot and those sorts of things because in these self-watering containers, that water is not moving, it's not flowing. So problems can happen. You have to be careful with that. These are such thirsty plants. I haven't had an issue with that. They take, they drink that water up so fast. Never been a problem. But just putting that out there to be safe if you were to decide to grow one of them in a, one of these self-watering containers, make sure that that water is not so high that the entire pot's saturated or sitting in the water. Self-watering containers aren't only useful just because these are really thirsty plants, they're also really useful because they do help a little bit, well actually probably a considerable amount, with helping to maintain some humidity around the plant, even though this is a fairly solid seal between the pot, the inner pot, and the outer pot it still keeps things nice and moist. So you don't have any soil drying out really at any point. And that helps keep the air a little bit more damp around the plant, which they appreciate. If you live someplace with high humidity, probably not something that you need to worry about. Where I live, winters are fairly dry. Like they're not horrible, but they can sometimes be a bit much and it can be hard to keep the humidity up around the plant. So this helps a fair amount. Now out here in this grow space, Humidity, not that much of an issue. It's, you can see down here when I don't have that running or the humidifier is running and I haven't watered the plants in several days, sometimes it gets kind of dry. And uh, when I was growing these just in regular potting mix, the leaves would start to go ahead and fold up as they do and start to get lots of brown tips on them, which is common. I mean, that's just kind of a thing with these plants is brown tips. That happens when you grow these inside, even when you grow them outside. If you're someone where having uh, some blemishes on the leaves of your plants or some brown spots or lines, if that's really gonna bother you, this might not be the plant for you. <laughs> I know we see lots of pictures of them looking perfect up on Instagram, but that's just not really reality for most people, not people who are growing them indoors under normal household conditions. At some point, you're gonna get some crispies on the plant, which is okay. You can cut them off if it bothers you. I tend to just leave them depending on how much of a issue it is. But with something like this right here, I'll go ahead and zoom in so you can see what I'm actually talking about. That might help. With a brown tip like this, I can go ahead and cut that off right there. But what's going to happen now is a little callus line, a tiny little brown line is going to form on the tip there where I made that cut. So it's kind of a matter of, do you prefer the having the long brown tip or having the brown line? Like I said, if it's not a very dramatic brown tip, I don't bother with it. It's fine, it can stay. You know, if the whole plant's covered in them or something like that, I would probably not do it that way. I'd wanna clean it up and tidy it and have it look nicer. But when it's just a few, you know, like just some of them here and there, that's all right. And real quick, I should clarify, when I refer to this as an easier to grow plant, I am meaning that in comparison to Calathea and uh, other plants that are in the Maranta family, these are fairly easy to grow compared to a lot of those plants. As far as just house plants in general are concerned, not necessarily the easiest to grow. I wouldn't say they're necessarily an easy to grow plant, just easier of their relatives. I don't do anything special with their water. It's just tap water. I mean, pond water, part of the year when these are outside, they float around in my pond. Totally fine. I keep the water pretty clean in the pond. It's not overstocked with fish and there's other plants in there. The water is usually crystal clear for the most part. It has its seasonal adjustment like all palms do. Overall though, that water is pretty clean and clear, but still, I mean, it's full of fish, it's outdoors. There's gonna be higher nutrient levels. It hasn't been an issue. Right now, this is floating in water that has been filtered, but that's a newer thing. Last year, I didn't have filtered water in here. It was just fish and normal tap water that's been treated, obviously, so the fish don't die and no problems. It was okay. That's going to vary depending on where you live, of course, right? Some people, if you have well water, just like really high mineral content or just super, super, super hard water, then there could be some problems there. That's just sort of a, you kind of have to go through the process of eliminations to see what's causing issues with the plant. If you notice edema, which basically like blemishes showing up in the foliage, almost like bruises, sometimes that can be related to the water the plant's getting an abundance of nutrients. Usually that means there's also probably some root burn going on, but not always. That's more common on like the ficus larata, 
they tend to do that fairly easily. And some, there are some ferns that'll do that too. But if you're doing everything right for the plant and it's just not growing and not doing all that well and slowly starting to weather away, then it could have something to do with the water potentially. I don't really know if that's going to be as much of an issue with the Trio Star as with other Calathea. See, the most frequent questions I get about these plants is generally in relation to the foliage, the behavior or characteristics of the foliage. So normally it's going to be the brown tips, which is generally just something that happens from low moisture, whether that be in the soil or in the air or both of those things. That's generally what causes brown tips. Yellowing foliage, is going to be from overwatering, which I know is weird because keep talking about how much this plant likes water, but it's important that it's not actually sitting in water unless it's oxygenated and circulating and moving, then there will be rot issues, root rot problems. And when that happens, the leaves will start to get a yellow tinge to them. They'll open up a little bit wider, kind of hang sort of flaccid. The plant system, everything from the roots all the way to the cuticle of the leaf, everything's just saturated with water. So it's fully wide and opened and just hoping that transpiration will help it out there. And then the curved leaves. So the trio stars are, they're in the Maranta family. So they'll naturally open and close their foliage. That's not unusual. That's what they're supposed to do. Uh, a few years ago, I had multiple people asking me, it's like they thought there was something wrong with the plant. It's totally normal that's okay as long as it's a day and night process. Generally, they'll be most open in the morning time, and then as things move into the afternoon, they'll slowly start to close up a little bit more, and then in the evening, they'll fold into more of like a taco-shaped leaf. They're smart plants. That's the way they're holding things in and protecting themselves. It's a really cool characteristic. But if they're folded all day long, that's something else going on there. Usually, that means that the plant's dry and needs more water, but if you check the soil and it's nice and moist, then that's probably not the case. The soil is moist, but the leaves are still folded. They're not yellow, they're just folded and still stiff, sturdy, healthy looking leaves. Maybe it might be a good idea to go ahead and bump those down to a little bit less light, It'd be helpful for the plant. And then another thing to consider would be temperatures. Even if the plant's getting the right amount of light and the watering and everything else is perfect, if the temperatures are too cool, it's not utilizing the water that's in that soil. Now that shouldn't typically be an issue with these in the house because even in the 60s, I haven't had any issues with these plants. They don't grow anywhere near as quickly. The more warm and humid of an area you can site these in, the faster they will grow in the house. They tend to not grow super fast because generally when you're between 65 Fahrenheit and 75 Fahrenheit, they're going to just kind of trot along. Below 70, they're not going to do much at all. You get a new leaf here and there. Overall, they'll just kind of hang out for the most part. But if that soil is really saturated and soggy and things are cold and they're not getting enough light, then it, well, that's just kind of the trifecta there. Give it more light, a warmer spot, and get the soil to dry out a little bit more. In the winter time, depending on where you live, sometimes letting the top inch to maybe two inches of soil dry out is okay for them. That's something to sort of experiment with. One of the great things about these plants is they will let you know when they're thirsty. So, I mean, they're always thirsty, right? Because it's, it's Jamanthi, they always like water. But if it's winter time, or maybe you just prefer to let your house plants dry out a little bit to help prevent having to worry about rot, those leaves will crisp up, not crisp up, they'll curl up. They'll go into those little trio star tacos and not open back up during the daytime. When that happens, that generally just means they would like some more water. Check to see if the soil's moist enough for them. Spider mites and mealybugs can be issues on these plants. For the most part, if they're getting a good amount of humidity and airflow, Spider mites shouldn't be a problem, but because of their shape, essentially, because of their growth habit, there's so much density in there. They're so full and so lush and beautiful in there. But plants that are like this can be a, a pain when it comes to bugs sometimes. But with plants like these, these are ones that I would usually take to a sink or to the shower and get them on their side and really rinse them out very, very, very heavily. Help get those bugs out and then spray them down with a horticultural oil or soap, whatever is to your preference to handle that situation. Blasting them off is usually a good idea and they like water so much, they really don't mind getting a shower every now and then. They enjoy their spa days. All right, on to the way I have these growing here. Most, I'll just focus on this one. This one right here is growing the same as they're growing in the same manner. It's just one's gonna be easier to show you than the other. I have both of these in the floating aquatic 
planters. You can just get them off of Amazon or you can make them yourself fairly easily with just a styrofoam ring and some landscape fabric. Really, really, really easy to make these. I think that this has enough root on it that I can set it down now. It used to be that I had to set this in a bucket or else this whole thing would just come down and pop the plant out, but it's rooted in there very heavily. It's got some nice solid structure going on. You can even see all the roots coming out the side of that felt there. Oh, there are a lot of roots coming out of that felt. This plant did a lot of growing. The only reason that this works for the plant is because I've had them set up in areas or floating in areas where the water circulates really well or has air pumps. In this pond back here, there's air pumps, so there's lots of oxygen in the water. This one I have floating in a fountain outside during the summertime, so that water's nice and oxygenated. There's a fair amount of nutrient in the water. I have to clean that fountain often because the birds take baths in it and then, you know, what birds do, lots of poop in the water. It hasn't affected the plant in a negative way at all. Like I said, this was in here with all kinds of fish and things last year, no problems at all. So I have found this to be the most impractical, but really just flawless. I mean, wonderful, great way to grow these plants, but not relatable because I know that most people don't have an above ground pond pool set up in their garage like I do. Maybe you have a big fish tank with a sump under it and you could float it in there, but then you wouldn't really see the plant very often. Suppose you could do something like this and put the plant into a bucket perhaps and have an air stone in there to move the water around and just grow it hydroponically. That's totally basically what I'm doing here. It's not very different from just a self-watering container. Really, it's just that the water has more oxygen in it and the roots are fully submerged in the water. Whereas this one over here, the roots aren't submerged except for as they're growing out of the bottom of the pot. Now that I see the roots coming out the sides of the felt on this one, I know that it's probably time to go ahead and repot it. I'm not going to do that now. I'll wait until things are warmer. Even though it is getting fairly toasty here in this growth space, it's still not quite where I'd want it to be. I'll probably wait until late spring to actually bump this up into a larger container just because that way it'll be outside. There'll be lots and lots of humidity and it'll be really warm. I mean, I, I have all those things in here, I suppose. It's just, I don't know, it just feels like the right thing to do. At that time, I'll probably do some propagating with the plant because these propagate so easily. You just pull them out of their pot and you can snip the rhizomes and take each little one apart, pot them up into a nice moisture retentive, organically rich soil and uh, within like usually I'd say four to six weeks, those will take root and start putting up more offshoots and get going. Something I've really enjoyed about this plant is even though I don't see them in the larger sizes as often as I used to, the rare plant trend of 2020 hasn't made them unobtainable or overly ridiculously expensive. I mean, well, the prices on them, I do think are a bit high right now but not as high as they could be considering they're variegated and they have the pink undertones really if i were to have to name like my favorite variegated plant this is probably it right here i haven't really put much thought into that but really i can't think of any that i like more than the trio star i love the variegation the way it's nice and creamy and there's different tones and then that beautiful pinkish red underside of the foliage that goes all the way down the petioles to the base of the plants and then they have those beautiful hot pink flowers on them and they're typically not unobtainable or insanely expensive i will say a little bit overpriced right now but not like most of the other things are i'm trying to think if there's anything i've left out as far as the troubleshooting goes and the frequently asked questions the curled leaves and yellowing foliage and brown tips are the most common ones i get and i guess overall i do get a fair amount of questions just wondering why their plants aren't really growing which I kind of talked about that's usually just going to be a matter of the plants not getting enough light or enough warmth or water any one of those things any combination of those things normal household temperatures they'll be okay but again the warmer you can make it for them the more growth you're going to get out of them or the faster the growth is going to be that you get from them oh and these two, this one right here and the one that's floating down there, I really didn't do anything as far as fertilizing is concerned with them since I got them. They were floating in, at least this one was floating, the one back there was floating in a pond with fish. So it really didn't need it. This one right here though, that was in a fountain where there was some nutrient because of the birds and everything. I probably should have put some slow release or continuous release down into the mix. I just didn't do it. I, I'll try and do better next year. Being sure to know what to look out for with root rot is probably important also because these are plants that like their soil to stay moist and uh, they can go a while without being repotted. 
So uh, you may have issues with root rot. If you notice any kind of foul odors coming out of the soil or like just they're infested with gnats, then it might be a good idea to go ahead and unpot them, give the roots a really thorough wash with like just room temperature water, maybe a spray down with hydrogen peroxide and then another rinse and then put them into a fresh potting mix. That might be a good idea. The very last thing I just remembered, I have to wrap this up. It's getting late. The grow lights even turned off. The level of variegation on the plants. That's the only other thing that I can think of that I've been asked about. I don't know if there's necessarily a way to increase the variegation on these. I have found that usually if you find one at the store that has lots and lots of variegation like this one does, then you're typically going to have a plant that has a lot of variegation. For the most part, it's just a good idea to pick ones out that already has a lot of variegation on it that will fluctuate a little bit depending on the type of light the plant's getting. If it's getting very, very, very low light, then there may not be as much variegation on the plant. I really haven't noticed as I've moved mine around over the years, the variegation changing because of the sunlight or the grow lights. I haven't noticed that. Comment down below if that's something you've noticed with the trio stars for the most part. Like I said, what I've noticed is it just kind of tends to be whatever you get is what you get. So try and pick one out that has a lot going on on the plant from the get go. All right, I'll plop this back in there. Wrap this video up, went on long enough with this plant spotlight. I hope everybody's doing well, having a great day and a great life, and everything's just going beautifully for you. Like I said, comment down below, tips, tricks, suggestions, always appreciated. It's how we all learn together and grow together, and go on and get your plant nerd on down there. Like I mentioned in the earlier part of this video, this is one of those plants where I really have kind of heard it all from people about how the plant will just grow flawlessly for them, no problem. And other people who have tons of house plants and are great with them, but for whatever reason, the plants just hate them. The trio star just throws a fit for seemingly no reason. And generally the issues are going to be related to light, water, humidity, maybe temperatures, or it might just need to be repotted. It'd be pot bound and just not able to take up everything that it needs or obtain it, period. So. Sometimes it helps just to pop your plant into a, something fresh. I need to go ahead and get all these filming lights shut off so these beauties can go to sleep and get some rest as always. And most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye, bye.